Did you get to bed well fed? I hear mumblings. People are still a little bit asleep. For those of you I have not met, my name is Tim Sample. I'm the president of INSA. And I want to welcome you again, for those who may not have been at the reception last night, uh, to this conference on, in my mind, rolling out analytic transformation. You may have heard bits and pieces, but here's where it all comes together. And the reason it all comes together this way is because Tom Finger and Mike Wertheimer are in the position in which they know that in order to be successful, in order to get the best minds thinking on these types of things, is to draw a group of experts together from outside and inside the community and to challenge them not only to listen about what's going on in the program, listen to what's been started, but also to give them feedback and to challenge them on some of their, uh, some of their assumptions, uh, on some of the things that they, they think they want to do, and maybe tell them some ideas that you may have. And you'll have a chance to do that throughout the day. You'll especially have a chance to do that in a uh, online Q&A session as you go, go away and think about the next couple days. Uh, there'll be an online Q&A session that will be uh, on the 13th, is that right, Tony, 13th of September. And we'll give you instructions on how to get uh, into that uh, before you leave. And then on October 11th in Washington, we will have a uh, follow-up session, which will be a town hall meeting format. And what that means is we'll have Tom and we'll have Mike and maybe some others sitting on a stage and basically it's going to be your turn to feed back to them. And that's the real key. We've done this once. It was very successful. Hope, hopefully uh, you all will engage again. I have just a couple of administrative announcements before we get going. First off, uh, hopefully everybody who wants to be signed on is signed on. I see a lot of laptops humming. You should have gotten a one-page instruction on how to get online in your packet. If you have any problems, kind of look around for one of the INSA staff who can get one of the technicians over to help you. Uh, they are all, you know, Rachel's back there in the, in the screaming red uh, outfit that we love so much. Uh, Jared's over here, Frank's over here, uh, I saw Jason a while ago. But just track them down and they'll get a technician to help you out. We, we do want, if you want to be online, you want to blog your questions in, that's what we're after. We want to do things a little differently and we want to make this very interactive. This session throughout the day will be simulcast in the room next door where breakfast was. There will be coffee and, and snacks and everything out there throughout the day. So if you need to get up and, and go over there and get another cup of coffee or whatever, you won't miss a thing because everything will be simulcast over there. Um, lunch, for those of you already thinking about another meal. Lunch is actually three floors down. I think we got that right. Three floors down, it's at the water level. So you just go out to the escalators and you keep going down until your feet are wet. And then uh, you'll see a room there and that's where we're serving lunch. There is a change to the program. Um, oh, by the way, when we have breaks, as I said, refreshments will be in the same room over there. There is one change to the program that I want to point out that hopefully everybody will like. In the program, there is a, a networking reception tonight. It is a purely voluntary networking reception. And in the original construct you'll see in the program, it was going to be in the chai bar. And it was kind of a, kind of a you know, if you want to go there and with a small group of people, you know, they made the bar available to us. And we decided, yeah, you know, networking's networking and, and going to have a drink's a nice thing, but why don't we uh, spice it up a little bit? So what we've done is we've changed the location for, for the reception tonight. Again, it's still voluntary, not mandatory. But we're, they've actually closed the Java bar downstairs in the lobby level and given it exclusive to us. And there will be an open bar and food down there to help your networking. So that's, so, that's a, uh, so that's a change to the program that I hope you'll all enjoy. Um, so we have quite a lineup. And as I said, the goal here today is to, in essence, for you, if you've never heard about some of these programs before and, and haven't heard what Tom is trying to do, uh, now is your opportunity to do that. If you've heard 
about some of the programs or perhaps read in the media in the last uh, couple of weeks about things like A space and that type of thing. Not only are you going to hear about that, you're going to have an opportunity to interact with the, the folks, including uh, the executive agents who are making that happen. Uh, this is about not only the government coming to you and giving you a lineup of what's going on, but it really is about you inputting back to them. And it starts today. As I said, you have three sessions today, next week, and in October. Today is the time that you really can get into the meat of what's going on. The other thing I'll mention, I'm sure Tom will, we're going to give you the, the programs that have started. It's by no means a, uh, a closed set. There are a lot of other ideas going on. This is only the beginning. And it's the type of thing that I think, at least when I've been briefed on these things, that generates some excitement. And it's an interesting and a difficult type of excitement because on the one hand, it's a type of excitement of something new, of something that I'll talk about in a second that's, that's rather revolutionary, which always scares people. But it's an excitement that is about the new workforce, in my mind, um, the, the young folks that are out there in the analytical community. And that's not saying anything bad or, or anything at all, actually, about, about the workforce that maybe has more than five years' experience or more than 10 years' experience, because everybody out there is doing a phenomenal job. And in my presentation, which I'm going to start in just a second, um, I'm going to start out right now by saying some of the things that I'm going to say is, are going to kind of point to some of the obstacles and barriers that I've noticed over the years in, in things like analytic transformation. And it's not meant to pin blame on anybody, and it's not meant to say that analysts aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, because in fact, every day, you know, they are to the best of their ability with what we give them to work with. But what we're really about today and, tonight, or, and tomorrow is about taking that to the next level. It's about harnessing technology and harnessing brilliant minds inside and outside of government so that in today's information environment, you're not only looking at classified programs, you're looking at the, the whole set of information, the whole information deck, and an ability to, to come up with the best possible answers when you don't have all the dots. And that's something I'll talk about a little bit um, also. And I have at least one person who agrees when I say this will stand up and cheer. Um, so with that, I want to welcome you all. Again, if you have any questions, track down one of the staff. Uh, the hotel has been phenomenal to us, so we're pretty sure that we can, can get what we need as we go forward. And I just hope that you enjoy the day. I appreciate almost everybody coming in business casual. I didn't want to be alone. Uh, and I just hope you, you sit back, relax, and absorb all this, because there's a lot to absorb. There's a lot going on. All right? All right, so what I want to do is go ahead and kick off with just a few points in my presentation, if we can have that up. So my presentation's entitled, Has Not Taken, Struggle to, uh, to Reform Intelligence Analysis. And it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, and what I really wanted to do is to point out a few things that, that we've observed along the way. Because let's face it. Reforming intelligence analysis, reforming the intelligence community is not something that's been happening since 9-11. You go back to, to uh, Harry Truman when he signed the, the National Security Act in 1947. And one of his complaints, if you look in, his, me in his, his memoirs, is that one of the reasons he did that, and one of the reasons, in fact, that CIA is in existence today, is because he looked around you know, post Pearl Harbor and realized that the Army and the Navy were really the two biggest games in town in terms of intelligence. They weren't talking to each other, and they certainly weren't talking to the president. So starting out on intelligence reform is something that has been kind of grinding away with fits and starts and some increases, some decreases, some, some successes. But in many respects, you end up with what I would call evolution as opposed to revolution. And when you go down that road, 
you can make some advances, but in the age of technology, sometimes you can't get caught up with where technology is going. And so I decided to just take, to, to just start things off, uh, a, a famous little quote from, from that wonderful person, Yogi Berra, uh, which is basically as you see here, when you see a fork in the road, take it. And that's our, that's, that's our goal here. As, as we see this, we're going to take up the fork, in this case, and go forward. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, people in the past have talked about dramatic changes and, and, and transformation and, and revolutions and things like that. And in some cases, you know, you've seen that type of thing. But as this says, uh, oftentimes what's labeled as revolutionary uh, ends up being not quite there. And there's a lot of different reasons. And everybody who has dealt with the federal government or state and local governments all know many of the reasons. It's the tyranny of the budget. It's the, <clears throat> it's the um, uh, can you have a program last with, with year to year spending? It's do you have the right people at the top pushing what needs to happen. It's a bureaucracy, or in this case, 16 plus bureaucracies, who continually ask the question of, do we really want to do this? Is this really the right thing to do? Is it even good for us to be doing? So it's a, it's a, a, a key that you have to remember that revolution is hard. Everybody knows it. Transformation is just as hard. But you have to keep at it. And the most of the, the things that start with, in my experience, start with legacy systems. Legacy systems for many companies out there are great things. You build a big, big legacy system, or in the case of the, of the uh, uh, evolution of the intelligence community, you build many multiples of legacy systems. Every once in a while, you might try to connect some of them together. But it's a pretty good, steady, uh, steady way to go. I mean, it's comfortable for the analysts. It's safe. They get, you know, it's a nice comfort level. You can kind of rely on it. And for companies, it's just as safe and reliable. You can make some evolutionary advances in technology as you go. Will you get to the cutting edge? Not always. But you kind of go along as you go along. Will you keep up with the pace of technology? Usually not. But what happens is the minute you start, and believe me, having been nine years on the Hill, I've seen this a lot. The minute you start with, a, with saying, well, the first thing we're going to have to do is keep the legacy system because we've invested in it too much. You have defined the parameters of your revolution or, in fact, evolution. Because the minute you want to stick with that legacy system, it's a signal that you're not going to get two steps ahead in a transformation process, in my view. Next slide, please. For the intelligence community, one of the things that, that is of key importance is obviously information. And as the intelligence community has developed and grown, there is for primarily security reasons that are, that are not something you can sneeze at or throw away. They're, they're, some of them are valid. But the fact is we got into a mode in which we have what I call the tyranny of information ownership. Many of the commissions have pointed this out, maybe not quite in that way, but many, many of the, the commissions have pointed this out as one of the issues for information sharing prior to 9-11. There are some legal issues, there are a series of other issues, but the information ownership issue is part of it. Because once you have an individual or an organization that believes they actually own the information, then it is their say as to how that information gets distributed. And if they don't want to distribute in a certain direction, you know, we're protecting that information. We're protecting sources and methods. We're protecting a lot of things. Does that lead to collaboration? Yeah, maybe within a building, although I would argue I've been to several intelligence agencies where even within the building is hard. And while it is a noble premise and a, and a right thing to protect sources and methods, 
when you are protecting information as, as a, I either give it or I don't give it, to the extent that you're not sharing it with individuals, analysts, or others, whether it's a state and local police officer, anybody that would prevent a crisis, that's when we need to reflect and take another look at, at this premise of information ownership. Not only that, in this world of, of information, with the individuals that we have, especially in the young workforce, having the concept of information ownership is almost anathema to them, in my experience. One of the things, and, and Tom and I have talked about this, one of the things that um, you heard early on as the intelligence community started rebuilding post 9-11 was the issue that over 50% of the analysts in the intelligence community have less than five years experience. And the interesting part that I found about that is every time I heard that on the news or anything else, it was done with a great deal of hand-wringing. Oh my God, what are we going to do? You know, It's such a young workforce. They're not experienced in everything else. The key, though, to that young workforce is they're natural collaborators. And so the real key is how do, you, how do you harness their energy? How do you get them excited and then take the natural talents that they bring and use them in a very constructive, transformative way? And if you're going to do the revolution, you've got to start there. Because you can have the top-down cover. But unless you have the grassroots influence, it's going to be very hard to do. So trying to capture young minds and trying to get them excited in some of these things, and, get, and what they will tell you is information is information. And information ownership is kind of, a, kind of an odd thing for them. So the tyranny of information uh, ownership is another, another issue uh, that has to be addressed. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that I found when I was an analyst and, and found uh, uh, later on and, and when I looked at analysis from, from different perspectives is every once in a while we forget to think. And technology is a wonderful thing. You're going to hear about some programs that have technology. You're going to hear a, a whole laundry list of things where we, we incorporate technology and it's all for the good. But I would posit to you that in an, area, in an age of the Cold War, when we were dealing with primarily denied areas, something that, that many of us in the room were very comfortable with, thank you very much, the only source of information was information that A, was classified, and B, was from sources and methods that you didn't talk about. And you really became reliant on those data streams and data flows. And my problem is that I've run into analysts in the community who I really are really good people. They really know how to do analysis. But they've kind of slipped into the paradigm that says, well, I'm going to get a picture, or I'm going to get this, or I'm going to get that. And so it's almost a repackaging of information more than it is analysis. And it's not that they're necessarily, you know, it, it's not that they're not doing it on purpose. It's just that you start relying on data streams and certain things so much that you sometimes forget to think. So remembering to think becomes a real key. And challenging the workforce, doing programs, getting them into a position to think really becomes important. Now, there was a New York Times article a couple days ago. And, and there were a couple quotes in it. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't pull a quote that I wanted to use. But uh, one of the quotes was from an individual who is very well respected, and I, I respect him greatly, um, who made a quote that kind of questioned whether or not um, a web-based analytical society, if you will, uh, will slip into another trap, which is in essence um, mistaking uh, collaboration for experience or collaboration for analysis. And it's a valid concern. But if we can get the young minds going at the beginning and do that grassroots transformation and also bring 
for all of us in the room who have had experience in analysis, bring that to the fore, then you start to have something. And that's when you start to really see trans transformation take off. Next slide, please. Ah, uh, yes. One of the things we went through in, tra in transformation so far in reforming analysis is tools. I can remember a period when you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting a new analytic tool. And tools are good for what they are, but they don't replace analysis. They help manage information. They help with the flow. They help do a lot of things. But, but tools alone uh, don't get you where you need to be. Now, you might wonder, OK, he's talking about this. What's the deal with dinosaurs and bipeds? Throughout, if you look at the history, what we've relied on to help, if you will, reform analysis tend to be bigger programs, tend to be the large LSI type programs in which you have a multitude of companies coming together for something that's going to last for years, whether it's a tool, whether it's an information, whatever it is. And company, again, it's a comfort level. I would argue that in, in today's world, and when you talk about analytic transformation, while there may be some of those issues, there may be, and this will be discomfort level for many in the room, while there may be some of those programs along the way, I would argue that it's kind of like the dinosaurs looking at the, standing there, and I'm going to, going to use a, a, a little term that was given to me that I love. And it's kind of like the dinosaurs standing there going, hey, look at the bipeds. What are they doing here? We don't want them. Well, they're kind of a nuisance. Why are they, yeah, they're running around here. We don't need them. We'll outlast them. Yeah. This is some of the things, the attitudes we're going to have to face as you look at programs with, with analytic transformation. There will be some larger programs, but I think the ones that will really catch hold, the ones that will make this transformative, are programs that are quick hitting, are programs that are, that are at the cutting edge of that tool technology, or the cutting edge of what we're trying to do. And for companies, and, and many of you represent companies, um, you know, in the room, this is something you really need to think about and something that I really want, I hope you'll take away from this as you listen to Tom, as you listen to Mike, as you listen to everybody else and you come to that October feedback session, part of the challenge is going to be you telling them, wow, there are some things that, that you know, if you allow us to do this, we could make great strides. So that's a challenge to you. And, and hopefully we won't turn into dinosaurs. Uh, next slide, please. Now, one of the other things we've done with analysis as we've gone through is that our answer to collaboration, our answer to crises, is to form task force, working groups, centers now. And while that does bring a lot of good people together and good information together, and everybody would argue that it does have a value add when you have everybody physically in the same space interacting every day and you get to know them and everything else. I would argue that there are a lot of, of young analysts out there who do the same thing and rarely see the other people that they're text messaging with, but they have the same comfort level. And that while we took a very strong approach in creating centers and creating task forces and everything else, what you really end up doing is you end up kind of getting the same collection of pieces together. They may come from different backgrounds. They may come from, from different ints. But at the end of the day, it's all a little bit the same. And it's different aspects of kind of the same approach. And it's also rather, or has been historically, a little bit insular. And getting out of that comfort level, especially in the, in the security domain environment, has been hard. And we've done pretty, a, a pretty good job. But I don't know of very many people that argue 
that for the type of information that's out there today and the challenges we have going forward, that this is the way to continue to go. Next slide, please. Now, right after 9-11, members of Congress stood up, and, and Mark Lowenthal and I can probably give you a list. Members of Congress stood up in unison with the, with the media and said, oh my God, what's wrong with the intelligence community? What's wrong with the analytical community? Why couldn't they connect the dots? And let's do commissions and let's do studies to go find how many dots were out there and, and then ask the question, who was responsible? Who's accountable for, collecting, or for connecting the dots? And the words of my good friend Mark Lowenthal, three-year-olds connect dots. The true spirit of analysis is to come up with a good picture, to come up with a good estimate, to come up with a good piece of analysis when you don't have dots. It's, coming, it's, it's separating the wheat from the chaff to find bits of information. You can call those dots. But to find the pieces that you need to form that picture, to complete that puzzle, to figure out what's really going on when, in fact, there's so much background noise that you may never see some of the dots. Heck, you may never see any of the dots. But still, an intelligence analyst has to proceed and has to figure out how to make a picture out of that mosaic and how to get that done in a timely fashion and reported to the right people. So that's yet another challenge and another, another area where in relying on connecting the dots, we won't get very far in the long run. Next slide, please. And of course, the other issue we have are people like myself. Now let me tell you, it was a struggle for me to create any of these slides. I didn't come from this background. Some people I've seen, it's natural. Boy, we can just whip this up, not a problem. And for me, I kind of look at it and go, oh, wow, now what? And geez, where, is, where was that text box button? I knew it was, I know it was here somewhere. And you get me out of, out of certain comfort level, and that's when I immediately turn to one of my staff, <laughs> who are all very uh, much younger and, and understand these things. And they, you know, they just kind of come in, and they're always very kind, and they nod their heads, and they think the poor doddering fool. And then they uh, have it done in about two minutes, and, and off we go. Um, but the fact is, there is an issue, and it's a cultural issue, and it's not just defending a bureaucracy or defending a culture necessarily, but it is a, a generational issue. And what we have now is something unique, something amazing in my mind. What we have now is a lineup at the senior level of the intelligence community who understand what analytic transformation might be and how important it is for the challenges we have ahead. The neat part about it, though, is that you also have the same feeling and the same attitude at the grass, grassroots analytical level. So the challenge, and I would posit the challenge to, to analytic transformation in many ways, is to try to figure out what you do with the analog masters. How do you get them to not only rely on the digital natives, but to actually become digital immigrants? Not an easy task. Not one that is cheery for many people, by the way. Um, because there's a comfort level. It's a comfort level that, that is hard to change. It's a comfort level that you don't necessarily want to change in many respects. So, in summary, what I would say is that we've had some good, good things that have happened with analysis over the years. We've had some dynamic efforts. We've had areas where we've had, you know, hard target studies, where we finally realized that 
if you're a really good analyst or if you're a really good set of analysts, that doing analysis day to day is a little different from bringing people together and saying, you know, how, what really are the missing links here? Because really, I talked about connecting dots before and the fact that that's not really analysis in many respects. The part of analysis that's often forgotten in my mind is that part, a major part of analysis is identifying the gaps. And when I talked about the, the, the reliance on technology and, and remembering to think, in many respects, when you talk about the gaps, you tend to forget that, I mean, you concentrate on, you know, do I need this, do I need that? And we perfected that. We've sent teams of people from various agencies all over the world to help military commanders and everybody else on how to task systems. And in my mind, if I'm a military commander, or if I'm the President of the United States, or if I'm anybody in a policy or decision-making position, I don't want to say, you know what I really need is this exact piece of information from this exact satellite or this exact source in this and that and that, and have to have somebody coach me through it so I can pass something the right way. I want a military commander to say, you know what, I've looked at all this and my question is, I don't know what's over that hill. Can somebody answer what's over that hill? And from an analytical perspective, that's really the key. It's positing what's over that hill. And if you don't have the dots to say this is exactly what's over the hill, now you're doing analysis. Now you're saying, here's the best we can do. Here is what we have. Here is what we're looking for, identifying the gaps, identifying the unknowns, and saying, here it is. Again, I'll, I'll end the way I started. That's not to, to, to you know, poke holes at what's being done today, necessarily. It's not to say we have to turn the collection world necessarily on their heads. I don't want to lay them on their sides a little bit. But the fact is <coughs> that to have analytic transformation, analysis has to drive collection. Analysis has to drive the debate. I, I have my, my last thought on this subject. Uh, we have another good friend in the audience, Bill Nolte. And for those of many of you know, Bill uh, used to run, I don't think he still is, the uh, Intelligence Fellows Program up at Y River. Great program. Great program for mid-career and above officers. And I was up there talking one day, and Bill and I were discussing a survey that they did to one of the classes, and it was a, one of the one of the questions on the survey was about politicization, and the question was: If an analyst walks in, if I remember it correctly, if an analyst walks in to a policymaker and has a discussion on on their report, and the policymaker starts to challenge some of their assumptions and some of their premises, is that politicization? A very high percentage that quite frankly shocked us, said the answer was yes. And that really disturbed me, quite frankly, because that's, at the end of the day, what analysis is all about. It's standing up in front of that decision maker and a policy maker and defending what you're saying or telling them what the possibilities are and engaging in a conversation so that when they come out, they can make the best educated policy or the best educated decision that they can possibly make. So as we go through this and we, as we go through analytic transformation, in my mind, one of the keys is figuring out how to deal with the analog masters and get them as part of this revolution. Um, now, I'm going to end it right there. I've kind of used up most of my time. I'm happy to, I've got about five minutes. I'm happy to engage in any discussion you might want to engage in. I'm starting to look at a couple things. Uh, one of the things, I don't know if you guys can see these on the screen or not. 
um, it says um, the leader the leaders still need to have face-to-face -face meetings but the worker bees are often much better with blogs I am an email they don't worry about policy or institutional trust they just want to work I think that's right I think that's right but I, I can remember by the way in in oh I'm going to date myself here I can remember in 1988 when I was a in essence a branch chief at NPIC when there was an NPIC um, and one of the debates we had in a division meeting was the issue of collaborative analysis and at what point did it become an agency position and at what point did managers have to grab hold of what those those analysts were doing and kind of grab take it from their grasp so that you could properly edit it put it in the right format and declare it as an agency position the horrible conversations that we had I mean they, they, I, but that was the background that was the bureaucracy that was the structure that was the key was, was how how does this evolve into an agency position and that's something else we have to deal with at what point do you get there in this world of analysis across the intelligence community, the community of analysts as I think Tom will talk to so as you think about this those are some of the struggles that I've seen. Those are some of the things that I think are challenges as we go through analytic transformation. Those are some of the things that I hope are very familiar to many of you in the room because you've lived through them yourself and you understand them. All right, so enjoy the rest of the day. Have, I have Frank walking up to me with obviously an important announcement, whatever that may be. Oh. And where? Oh, I have a, a tablet here with a pen in it. Oh, yeah, I got it right here. All right. So with that, enjoy the rest of the day. Get on the blogs, challenge these guys, have a good time. Thank you.